Good afternoon. Well, <laughs> well, let's keep that up. Welcome. <laughs> um, it's great to see um, so many of you here uh, over at the law school or um, at the law school in this meeting, if you're already here. Um, uh, it's, I'm Karen Engel, and I'm co-director of the Rappaport Center. And it's a real honor for us today um, to have L.B. Eisen here. Um, uh, as you know, since you came to hear her, she's written a book which is over here, and I can, you know, hold up so you can see it. Um, it's called Inside Private Prisons, An American Dilemma in Age of Mass Incarceration. Um, and there are a few of them in case anyone wants them. Um, and uh, the book was published by Columbia University Press in 2007. And it's amazing, since we invited LB, how many people said they had read the book and were really eager um, to be here and engage with her. Um, I'll just give you a quick overview of how things are going to run and then turn it over um, to LB and our other speakers. So um, I'll invite in a moment James Spindler, who is my colleague here at the law school and is also at the business school, um, to introduce LB. And he, when he told us that she might be in the neighborhood, said, you know, this isn't my field, but if you'd be interested in having her speak, um, I bet I could get her here. Um, but actually, James uh, teaches private law and corporate law and public regulation of corporate activity. So I think that um, he was uh, understating the overlap that he might have um, with her topic. Um, he's going to introduce her, and uh, we're excited uh, that they're, they're old college friends able to come together. I should also say I just learned that LB, um, which James might say, but she actually did her first year of law school here, um, so has a connection to UT. Um, after uh, James introduces LB and she speaks, um, we will um, have the honor to hear from Michelle Deitch here, who many of you know. She teaches at the LBJ school and also at the law school. Um, and uh, Michelle Deitch is an expert on criminal justice and juvenile justice, um, has written and spoken and done work extensively on the topic. Um, some of her areas of specialty include independent oversight of correctional institutions and prison conditions, um, and I suspect she will draw from that and other parts of her expertise in her response. Um, and it also turns out that uh, she and LB have been um, wanting to meet each other for some time, so we're glad to make that happen. So um, thank you all for being here, and I'll turn things over to James. All right. Well, I'm pleased and honored to be able to introduce my old friend L.B. Eisen, um, who's here to give us tips about what private prison stocks to invest in. <laughs> um, so L.B. comes to us from L.B. comes to us from the Justice Program of NYU's uh, Brennan Brennan Center. Uh, there she is uh, senior counsel and supervises students in their public policy advocacy center clinic. Um, LB has written prolifically on issues of criminal justice and in particular on the topic of mass incarceration as, as we know. Um, her writings have appeared in law reviews, think tank reports, trade publications, and the popular press. Uh, her, new, her new book, as, as Karen mentioned, uh, has just been published by Columbia University Press. Um, I highly recommend it if you haven't, uh, if you haven't yet read it. Um, it's a good, it's a very good read. Um, so after graduating with her JD from Georgetown, I guess after a year, after a year here, I didn't realize that, uh, LB uh, gained on the ground experience uh, incarcerating people as an assistant district attorney in New York City, only, only very bad people. Um, prior to law school, uh, LB also worked as a, as a beat reporter for a Laredo Daily newspaper, so her journalistic skills come from there in part, where she reported on uh, criminal justice issues. Uh, prior to that, LB attended Princeton University, uh, where among other various accolades, she was my next door neighbor. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming LB Eisen. Thank you for that introduction, James. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, so yes, I, I actually, I, I did complete my first year of law school here and loved it and just mentioned most of my friends from law school are actually from the University of Texas. Um, 
and thrilled to be here and thrilled to be in Texas where I know all of these issues are really um, important with, you know, the state's reliance on private prisons and specifically its reliance on private prisons um, to manage and own the immigration detention centers that are um, sort of peppered throughout the state. So I will speak uh, briefly um, and I really, you know, at the end really um, we both look forward to your questions because I think that's usually um, the most exciting part of a lot of these talks is the Q&A. So please, please, anything, I mean, ask anything. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts. Um, so I'm Senior Counsel at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law in New York. And this project grew out of my work at the Justice Program where we work on policies and um, research to end our nation's reliance on incarceration. I think everyone who's in this room is probably very well aware that we incarcerate 2.2 million people in the US. About 1.5 million people are in state and federal prison. About 700,000 are in jails. Um, that doesn't even include the 12 million uh, people who churn in and out of jails on a yearly basis. Some of those are repeat individuals. Um, but that gives you a sense of how punitive our nation is. Um, we are the world's um, largest incarcerator. And it's because of our policies and our punitive policies. We incarcerate far too many people, and we incarcerate people for very long periods of time. And this project is really about the intersection of profit and incarceration. And you know, just to state up front, um, we would have had private prisons I'm sorry, we would have had uh, mass incarceration with or without the private prison industry. Um, the private prison industry did not create mass incarceration. Um, but that's not what drew me to this work. What drew me to this work was how we as a country have relied on these corporations to manage and care for so many incarcerated individuals and so many immigrant detainees um, since the 1980s. And to me, you know, this was a story about um, the American system of punishment, um, you know, what this intersection of capitalism and incarceration meant. Where did the private prison industry play a role in our growing prison populations? How did they play a role? Um, so those were the questions that really drove this inquiry and drove this research. And you know, one of the core um, questions that the book asks is, is it legal to delegate such a core government responsibility to corporations? Um, you know, if we as a country have decided that um, someone has violated the criminal code and someone should be convicted for violating the criminal code, can we delegate that responsibility to a corporation to house those people, care for those people, clothe those people? Um, the book raises profound questions about economic development. Um, the book looks at rural prisons and the private prison industry's footprint in small rural towns that are economically depressed, um, state responsibility, morality, and the nature of punishment itself. <laughs> and really, at the, the central theme is, what does our increasing reliance on the private prison industry mean for the American justice system? And when I was writing this book, you know, I work at the Brennan Center for Justice, which is a think tank advocacy organization. Um, and I spoke to a lot of very thoughtful advocates as I was writing this book, a lot of formerly incarcerated individuals who spent time in private prisons. Um, I spoke to a lot of individuals who are still incarcerated in, in private prisons today. I spoke to a lot of families uh, of incarcerated individuals. And I struggled with. Um, whether I should offer solutions, whether I should offer reforms. Uh, there are a lot of people who believe that the private prison industry and any, any sort of um, profit off of incarceration is just morally wrong. And the conversation ends there. And the book doesn't make a judgment about that decision. But what the book does do is say, if, if we have private prisons at all, um, if we have you know, any corporation managing private jails, 
private prisons, private immigration detention centers. We owe it to those people who are behind bars in those facilities to improve their conditions of confinement, to improve access to those facilities, to improve transparency and improve accountability. And so the book asks, if as a matter of principle, it's wrong to profit from punishment, anything short of abolition, including proposing important reforms, does risk complicity with what some may say is an indefensible industry. But in the meantime, tens of thousands of people are cycling in and out of these facilities. And so the book does end, and I can talk about that um, as well, but the book does end with some pretty bold reforms to change um, how the private prison industry does operate today. And the story of private prisons really begins in the mid-1980s. Um, the book details you know, the history of the privatization of justice in this country, the privatization of police, firefighters, judges, arbitrators. Um, but the, the focus of this book is these uh, corporations, such as the, uh, today's GEO Group, CoreCivic. These two corporations um, combined, just those two, earned $4.5 billion in revenue in 2016. Um, they are publicly traded on the stock market. And the book looks at how that industry emerged. And the story begins in the mid-1980s, uh, when over three quarters of states were under some sort of federal court order to reduce their prison populations. Prisons were overcrowded, they were inhumane, they were unhygienic, uh, there were sexual assaults, riots. And a group of astute businessmen got together and they said, you know what, the government's doing a pretty lousy job of running our, our prisons we can do it better. And in 1985, in Tennessee, a fledgling corporation called Corrections Corporation of America, um, a lot of people know it as CCA, it's now rebranded itself in its core civic, it made this unprecedented offer to the state of Tennessee. And CCA told the, the governor, Lamar Alexander, and his wife, Honey Alexander, was an early investor in CCA at the time, and CCA offered to take over the state's entire prison system for a 99-year lease and $250 million. And Tennessee thought about the offer. It was one of those states that was under federal court order to quickly reduce its prison population. And Tennessee ultimately rejected the offer. Their state attorney general raised a lot of questions about morality and you know, logistical questions about how this w would work. But the offer made headlines across the country. And Thomas Beasley, who was the president of CCA, told a group of reporters at the time, if I was the state of Tennessee, I couldn't do it fast enough. And there's this wonderful article by the Chicago Tribune covering this unprecedented offer. And the quote still um, is a very prescient quote, and you know I write about it in the book because I think it still holds true today. And the the article notes there was considerable confusion at the Tennessee Capitol last week about whether the lobbyists for CCA were cavalry coming to the rescue or profiteers coming to exploit. And I th sorry, hearing the feedback. That quote is. Um, was very prescient and I think sums up four decades of debate about what the private prison industry's role is in the American justice system. And the book notes, um, you know, in, in the title of the book, it says an American dilemma. And that's because this has been a debate. And there are people who have very strong ideas on both sides of the debate. Um, but there has been confusion about what it means for the private prison industry to manage so many jails and prisons and detention centers. And even though Tennessee rejected the offer, the New York Times ran an above-the-fold headline, you know, company offers to take over entire state prison system. And that was free publicity for CCA. And... Governors took notice, directors of corrections took notice, and that was the beginning of these the, the private industry um, in corrections in the United States. 
And within a couple of years, other companies had started to form and had started to contract with state directors of corrections to build prisons um, because so many states were really under the gun. I mean, directors of corrections were really under a barrel to um, reduce prison populations. And you know, the book notes, and, and it's easy to say this is Monday morning you know, quarterbacking, but today we're having these conversations about de-incarceration. You know, Texas has led the way um, having conversations with conservatives and progressives about how to safely reduce prison populations, um, whether incarceration is the right sanction for so many people who violate the criminal code, um, providing alternatives to incarceration, mental health treatment before prison and in, in prison. But back in the mid-1980s, these conversations simply weren't being had. Um, Ronald Reagan was president of the United States, mayors, policymakers, governors, prosecutors, anyone running for elected office had to be seen as tough on crime. You know, soft on crime w was seen as the kiss of death. And this industry offered to build prisons cheaply, um, more efficiently, and allowed policymakers to avoid very complicated government procurement laws. And Policymakers didn't have to raise taxes, they didn't have to raise bonds, and they could outsource their, you know, their overage of incarcerated individuals to the private prisons. And that's exactly what happened. And so the book asks this central question of why weren't those tough conversations being held? You know, how did we let corporations manage jails and prisons um, so quickly without asking these questions. And part of that reason was because um, governors, directors of corrections really had no choice at the time. They were under um, court order, but the, the court orders had dates certain. You know, you need to reduce your prison population in these three prisons by, you know, s in 60 days. Um, so some states had started to release individuals early, but a lot of states felt that they couldn't do that, that there would be, be political backlash. So the private prison industry really came in as the safety valve and allowed policymakers not to have the tough conversations that a lot of states are having today. And Texas is one of the states that did start to have these conversations um, more recently. And in the book, um, I detail a congressional hearing um, around this time, it was in 1985, the private prison industry had its first congressional hearing. And I would, all of you should read the transcript if, if you're interested. It's actually really, really good reading. And it provided the private prison industry with its first time to testify on Capitol Hill. And you know, the book details some of the testimony, and I think it illustrates just how much confusion there was about the power of this industry at the time and where the industry was going. Um, the president of CCA testified and the head of the Judiciary Committee at the time asked, what do your corrections officers wear? And you know, this official from CCA said, you know, brown, brown is our color. And the whole conversation was about the color of their trouser, trousers and the uniform. And that's the level of discourse at this congressional hearing. And I bring that up because it's, it, it really does illustrate you know, how confused everyone was at the time and the questions that just weren't being asked. And even the ACLU testified at this hearing. And you know the ACLU is really a thorn in the side of the private prison industry today. And you know, they submitted testimony saying, we need to watch the industry. We're just not quite sure you know, what to make of it yet. Um, so that, you know, that's how new this was. And the book ultimately finds that the private prison industry does suffer from significant lack of transparency and accountability. And when we talk about prisons and jails and detention centers, they're black boxes as is. Um, you know, I'm in New York City, and um, Rikers Island is a government jail, and the you know oversight agency, the Board of Corrections in New York City, has trouble getting you know documents about Rikers Island, and 
journalists have trouble gaining access to the facility and finding out what happens inside. That's a government facility. When we talk about the private prison industry, it's much harder to gain access to what happens behind those, those metal bars. At the federal level, the private prison industry is not subject to FOIA, so they're not subject to the Federal um, Information Act requests. At the state level, in almost every state, the private prison industry is not subject to the open records request laws. Um, Texas, through litigation, um, Texas, Tennessee, Florida, um, because of litigation on behalf of advocates, um, does have more transparency than other states, but it's mostly because of the hard work of all of these advocates on the ground. When we talk about immigration detention centers, um, this is where civil detainees who have not been convicted of um, violating any laws, right, these are, these are people who are here um, illegally awaiting hearings, um, these individuals are warehoused in these immigration detention centers, and I spent time in a couple of them in Texas, in Laredo, and in Pearsall. Um, a lot of the immigrant detainees spend a large portion of their day on bunk beds watching television. Um, they're not provided any programming, and it's a cheap way to warehouse individuals. Um, and so, you know, people ask, well, well, how can you make those immigration detention centers better? Um, it's very hard for advocates, for lawyers to um, gain access to these facilities to find out what's happening behind those bars, uh, and partly that's because we have, you know, we have let the private prison industry emerge without creating the proper um, accountability standards. And you know, the book makes an argument that one of the reasons why we have not asked the corp these corporations to be um, as accountable as the government is because they were the safety valve. You know, they did emerge very quickly when so many directors of corrections and governors were under a gun to reduce prison populations. So there just wasn't the time and there wasn't the thoughtful thinking about how to ensure that these were accountable institutions. Um, ultimately, the book, um, so the book looks at divestment, cam divestment campaigns across the country. I interviewed students at Columbia and Swarthmore and Yale um, who are spearheading these divestment campaigns to um, ensure that their institutions are not investing in any of these corporations or any funds that these corporations are invested in. Um, I interviewed a lot of formerly incarcerated individuals and incarcerated in individuals in private prisons about their experiences in the private prisons. And even though it's a small subset, there was a theme amongst the individuals who I interviewed. Um, many of them actually said that they preferred their time in these private facilities more than in the government facilities. Um, and I would sort of push them and say, well, why is that? And a lot of the individuals said there was less staff. Um, and you know, partly that's, that's how these corporations save money. Um, but they felt they weren't watched as much. Um, I spoke to some individuals who were not allowed to use computers because they were convicted of, um, you know, pornography charges or you know charges that that, um, you know, because of their sentence they weren't allowed to use computers in prison. But in these private prisons, the rules were a little bit more lax. But I, you know, with ev every one of these individuals, I played devil's advocate and said. You, what, what do you think about the fact that there is an industry that's profiting off of incarceration? And I didn't know what the responses would be, but you know, in my sample size, small sample size, the individuals I interviewed for the book, everyone said they believed that, you know, passionately believed that corporations should not be making money off of incarceration. Um, and a lot of the individuals, um, you know, let me quote them in the book and you, you can read it, you can read about their thoughts um, but there is this feeling amongst those people who spend time in these private prisons that you know there's something very wrong you know there's something very immoral about corporations making money off of our country's predilection for more and more incarceration and so you know what 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 are the solutions um, how do you improve an industry that suffers with, from significant transparency and accountability issues? And, you know, when I wrote the book, um, 
Obama, President Obama was President of the United States. And um, in the summer of 2016, Deputy Attorney General um, Sally Yates issued this memo to the Bureau of Prisons um, instructing them not to continue to renew contracts with private prisons at the federal level. And the stocks of Geo Group and CoreCivic tanked and you know, headlines in newspapers across the country noted, you know, is this the end of the private prison industry? Is you know, Obama going to put the private prison industry to bed? Um, when President Trump was elected, uh, the stocks of CoreCivic and Geo Group shot up pretty quickly. And we started to see an increasing reliance on the private prison industry. So Attorney General Sessions is issued a very short one paragraph memo um, to the BOP when he um, took the reins at the Justice Department, um, reversing the Obama era guidance and told the Bureau of Prisons that they would need that capacity in the future. So please continue to renew those contracts. Um, and the one paragraph memo is important because Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates had cited an Inspector General's report that had come out about a week before her memo that cited um, and found that private prisons at the federal level um, suffered from you know, significant lack of accountability um, and that conditions were you know, not the same. Um, they were more, they were unsafe and they were not as, um, they were not as safe as federal prisons. And you know, that Inspector General report had really been one of the reasons that the Obama administration um, had started to curb its reliance on the private prisons. Additionally, the Bureau of Prisons um, population has been reduced. And you know, the book um, does note that if, one, if the government is going to rely on private prisons, you know, one of the benefits of that is that you can quickly close these prisons. Um, you usually have non-union staff, and it's easy to close a private prison. You just end the contract. Um, and that's exactly what the Obama administration did. And you know, now we're, we're in, the, in almost February of 2018, and it's a very different world when we look at the private prison industry. So the book makes some suggestions for how to improve transparency, accountability, in these institutions and really focuses on changing the incentives of the industry. And the idea is, you know, if I were a director of correction today, I would rip up every contract I had with the private prison industry and rewrite those contracts and require that these corporations um, reduce recidivism rates more than the government is doing. And you know, the private prison industry will say, well, that's impossible. How can we do a better job than the government? We're just handed these individuals. This is one phase of their life, but there's a lot they can do. Um, and I scoured the country, you know, looking for any state that had such a contract. And um, my research led me to New Zealand and Australia, where public-private partnerships in those countries encourage these corporations to reduce recidivism, and the governments in Australia and New Zealand are actually paying these corporations to reduce recidivism rates more than the government can. And that's innovation that's happening elsewhere that's not happening in the US. Um, you know, no contract with, the, with a private prison corporation should ever um, allow these corporations to receive uh, money as, you know, to, to be paid as if the facility were 100% full. And that's happening right here in Texas. In, in Dilly, Texas, there's an immigration, a family immigration detention center owned by CoreCivic. And CoreCivic is paid as if the facility is 100% full, even if it's half full. And the book makes a lot of recommendations for how to incentivize these corporations to improve conditions of confinement, improve transparency, accountability, um, you know, I, I, as an example, and I write about this in the book, um, had a really difficult time getting access to these prisons and detention centers, and the only way I was able to gain access was because I knew directors of corrections in Colorado, in, um, te in Texas, in New Mexico, um, so it was always through the government, and with these immigration detention centers, I was able to gain access through ICE. Um, I just filled out a, a stakeholder form. I'm sure you know some of you in clinics might have been in some of these facilities. 
Um, and I tried, and I detail this in the book, I, I tried to interview the CEOs of CoreCivic and Geo Group. I sent them emails. I said, send me information about your most innovative prison, about your best prison, the thing you're most proud of. Um, what's difficult? You know, where do you think you've been treated unfairly? What do you think is hard about what you're doing? And I really, really wanted to include information in the book from their point of view. Um, and it was sort of crickets. And, and I write, you know, I, I detail in the book, you know, every email I sent, every response I got. Um, you know, ultimately, I never gained access to any of these facilities through the corporations themselves. And I think that's really important because if we're going to ask these corporations to stand in the shoes of the government, um, they need to give access to researchers and journalists who want to find out what's happening in these facilities. Um, and so the book looks to the future and, you know, ultimately, um, brings up questions of accountability, transparency, conditions of confinement, and says, you know, we've had the private, private prisons have existed for four decades. Where's the innovation that was promised? And in 1985, um, the head of CCA was on 60 Minutes. He was interviewed by Morley Safer. And he said, you know, we're going to innovate where the government hasn't. And, you know, we're going to do better. And we haven't seen that innovation. Um, I don't want to bore you with co the cost savings research. We haven't seen the cost savings. Um, we haven't seen any of the promise that the private prison industry offered. And it's time that we hold their feet to the fire. So if we're going to have you know, private prisons for one more day, we really need to finally hold them accountable. We really need to say, if you want to make money off of this, you need to reduce recidivism rates. You need to improve conditions of confinement. And changing the contracts is one really important way that we can start to do that. And, you know, that is happening in other countries, but that's not happening here in the U.S. Um, and so I'm happy to answer questions about the research. Um, but I will turn it over um, to Michelle right now to, to continue. And please, you know, ask questions about the process and, and the book. And, you know, I'd love to answer any questions you have. Great. Thank you so much, LB. That was a terrific presentation, and I think your book is wonderful. Um, there's very, very little in there that I would not endorse wholeheartedly. So uh, I think you did a wonderful job. Um, I want to pick up on just a few of the points that you made today and, and more uh, in, in more detail in the book. Um, first, it's important, this, despite the way that uh, public, public officials tend to look at uh, private prisons, this is not just a matter of cost savings. They, public officials tend to think of it as a matter of uh, dollars and cents, but in fact there's a lot of human rights issues that are inherent in how these facilities operate, um, and we need to see it as a human rights issue as well. Um, LB was talking about oversight issues, and uh, I think that that is, is a really critical issue here. Um, uh, there is the lack of transparency that she mentions uh, in terms of inability to get information about how these facilities operate. You can't get into the facilities. You can't request data. They're not subject to FOIA. Um, they don't submit data even where public, uh, public agencies submit data about safety issues. They no longer do that because they realize that information was being used. Um, they're not subject to the Administrative Procedures Act, so we don't even get to see how they um, uh, regulate themselves or, or develop, uh, develop rules. Uh, no opportunities for public input. Um, what they do have and what, they, um, what you hear referred to, and you talk about it a lot in the book, is the contract monitoring process, where um, uh, when agencies, public agencies contract with these uh, private prisons, there's um, uh, an opportunity for the, for the public prison agency to monitor what's going on in the facility. But there are a lot of limits to that, and I think it's very, very important to talk about that. First of all, um, contract monitoring is not the same as monitoring, in, as we would think of it in a public prison context. Uh, 
let me back up and say we don't have much oversight of public prisons in America at all. It's commonplace outside of the U.S. It's very, very rare in the U.S. Um, but, the, and I'm talking about the kind of monitoring where someone could just go in, look and see what's happening, uh, make sure that inmates' rights are being protected, that they're safe, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That is a very different kind of monitoring than contract monitoring. With contract monitoring, you're monitoring compliance with the contract. Is the agency doing what it said it was going to do? And so the, what the contract monitor can do is only as good as the underlying contract. So if the contract doesn't have provisions in it um, that speak to, for example, human rights issues, safety issues, then there's not going to be any monitoring of those issues. Um, and it's, it's the rare contract that's going to incorporate those kinds of provisions. Um, so that's, that's one point I want to make, is that contract monitoring is only as good as the quality of the contract. Um, there's also a particular problem that arises when you've got counties as opposed to states. When states contract with prisons or private prisons, they are repeat players. So they have a lot of experience in how to write these contracts. They've had many, many years of doing this. And some of them do a really pretty good job. Texas used to go around training other states in how to do that. When counties contract for a private jail, they don't have that. They're not repeat players. A lot of them are very unsophisticated in how to do this sort of thing. This is particularly true when you've got your impoverished counties along the border that are being approached about, hey, let's put in a um, uh, immigrant detention center here, or let's expand your, your jail as an economic development uh, uh, strategy. Um, those county commissioners don't necessarily know what should go in a contract. They think this is a matter of just well, you'll take X number of inmates for this amount of money. And uh, may maybe they'll get around to saying, you know, what level inmates uh, they should be in terms of the security level. Or maybe how much food they should be given. But they're not getting into any kind of detail on what uh, rights those inmates should have or um, safety kinds of issues. So you've got the problem of unsophisticated contract uh, contracting agencies. Okay. Um, another problem with the lack of oversight is that, p for the federal system in particular, you've got facilities that are scattered all over the United States. So who's responsible for that? If you've got a few beds in one facility and a few beds in another facility, um, who's going around and making sure that those particular inmates' rights are being protected? Um, this is also a problem when you, you're talking about states that export prisoners to other states. Who's watching out for what happens to them? Okay. Um, now, there's other concerns about things you might want to have in a contract that go to human rights issues. And for some of these points, I'm picking up on uh, work that's been done by Alfred Amon, who's written about what he calls the democracy deficit in, uh, in private uh, prison contracting. One of his concerns is the fear of contracting away too much of the system. Um, if, if you do as, uh, you know, what was um, done in, in Tennessee where you're trying to contract out the entire system, you, if there's a problem, there's no one to step back in and take control over those facilities again. Okay? It's one thing if you've got a system of 100 facilities, like in Texas, and you contract out a few of those facilities. But if you've contracted out the bulk of your facilities and things go, you know, go south in terms of the treatment of inmates, who's supposed to step in and take those over? Who's supposed to run them again? And that's particularly true if the state has sold off its facilities or if the facilities themselves <coughs> are owned by the private company. That's not always the case. Sometimes they just operate a facility that's owned by the state. But if the facility itself is owned by the private company and they say, okay, we're disappearing, well, where are they supposed to put all those inmates now? So you lose control over what happens to the inmates if the state contracts away too many facilities or if it doesn't own the facilities. Another concern is contracts that are too long. Um, he, Alfred Amon recommends a three to five year a window or contract period. Um, there also needs to be a clause for early termination. 
Um, LB, you mentioned that you could, always, you could just end a contract, but you can't just end a contract, particularly if these are 10, 20, or longer year contracts. So that's a concern. Um, another issue that you, you alluded to are the uh, conditions issues, and I want to talk about that as well. Uh, there's a long history of problems that have arisen in these facilities. Um, some of them are structural. If they underpay staff, because staffing is the most expensive part of any operation, any prison operations, and that's one of the ways in which uh, profits are made is that you pay staff less. In fact, in a lot of facilities, staff get paid, uh, private prison facilities, staff are getting paid about the level of a fast food worker. Um, so because they're not being paid well, they turn over very frequently, or if new jobs in the community open up, they go there as well. Um, when you've got that kind of turnover, you've got inexperienced staff. Inexperienced staff are a recipe for disaster and safety issues. Um, there are also, uh, there's a lack of training of these staff too. Training is another area that tends to be um, uh, cut back in these institutions. This has given rise to significant scandals all over the country. Um, just to mention a few that have you may well know about Walnut Grove in Mississippi, um, horrible uh, treatment of juvenile inmates in a juvenile prison. Uh, Brazoria County, Texas, where staff were using inmates in training videos for how to, uh, to train dogs, and the inmates were allowed to be attacked by the dogs for the training video. Uh, Youngstown in Ohio, a prison that, a private prison that erupted in riots. And here in Travis County, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, that we have a, what's called a state jail here in Travis County. Um, and when it first opened, it was privatized. Um, then it, not too long after that uh, time, 12, uh, 12 officers at the facility were charged with sexually abusing inmates, and the state had to come in and take over the facility. So it's now state run again, but it had been, it had been privatized. Now, not all private facilities are bad. I mean, LB talked about inmates who said, well, you know, it's nicer or we get access to more things. There's plenty of that. I've been in facilities that look plenty good. Um, but I think that it's uh, important to point out that you also get better results if you're paying for those results. You mentioned that, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in Australia and New Zealand, the uh, uh, government said you've got to give us better results in terms of um, lowering recidivism. But they're paying for that. You don't, you, you can't get both. You can't get cost savings and better conditions. You know, pick one <laughs> or pick the other. You don't get both. Um, and if you are going to, if you are willing to pay more to get those better conditions or better outcomes, why not do that for the public facilities as well? Because our public facilities are sadly um, underfunded for the kinds of services that they should be providing. Um, we also should be using private facilities to raise the bar, not lower it. And that's been a real concern. There was something that happened quite explicitly here in Texas uh, not that many years ago. Uh, there was a debate in the legislature that would have vastly expanded the um, availability of, or opportunities for privatization in the state. And there was a clause in the draft, uh, the draft bill, that said that the private prisons <laughs> needed to operate um, at no lower a level than the best facility in the system. Well, the private companies were not happy about that at all. And they came in and were very explicit, saying we should not be required to operate at any higher level than the lowest performing unit in the system. Now think about that for a minute. I mean, first of all, that's trying to uh, institutionalize, no, no pun intended, the worst conditions in the system and say, we're not going to do any better than that. Um, but you know, they, they saw that as a matter of fairness, that they shouldn't be asked to do anything that the public system couldn't do. Um, okay. And, okay, another issue that I wanted to raise, um, you made the point very beautifully in your book, and you alluded to it in your, your presentation here, 
is that private prisons um, have let policymakers off the hook for recalibrating the nation's system of punishment, that they've avoided difficult conversations because they were available and therefore we didn't have to discuss who should we really lock up. Absolutely true. There's another way that that happens, though, um, and it's what I think of as subverting democracy. Um, because private prisons have come up with innovative ways of financing uh, these prisons, the development of the prisons, they have not, uh, the government has not needed to go to the voters f uh, to approve bonds, okay? So what I think of as very fundamental decisions about whether we should expand prisons, whether we should have prisons, the public's been taken out of that discussion and that debate. It is very much something that is between uh, government officials and, uh, um, and the private companies. And this is particularly true at the local level. Um, the last point I wanted to make before we get into discussion has to do with the rebranding of a lot of these private companies. Um, you talk about it in your book how uh, in recent years, the private companies are becoming sort of softer and gentler versions of themselves. As the nation has moved more towards a rehabilitative approach to incarceration, so too have the private companies started saying, all right, we're going to provide reentry programs or treatment programs. And they're getting into sort of the, the softer side of corrections. Um, I think it's really tempting to give the private companies a pass because they are doing work on what we think of as the good guy side of corrections. Um, one of the concerns is that those treatment programs, reentry programs, et cetera, they're largely unregulated. Anyone can call what they're doing a reentry program or a treatment program. How do we know what's going on there? Um, just because they've relabeled what's happening doesn't make it good, doesn't mean that there isn't a need for transparency or accountability about what's going on there. There remains little to no oversight, even of these more uh, good guy types of programs. Um, and even in those programs, you could look at New Jersey, for example, there's a track record of frequent escapes and high recidivism rates coming out of those programs. So we've got to be careful about that rebranding and not give them a pass. And finally, just to, to close my comments here, I think that we have gotten the private prisons that we've wanted. They are a reflection of what's important or not important to us or, or at any point in time. We got these prisons built as warehouses at a time when we were warehousing prisoners all over the country. And we don't, we don't care about oversight in this country, oversight of prisons and jails. So we're not caring about how these, the prisoners in these facilities are treated either. Um, if we're horrified by the things that we are seeing or learning about these facilities, it's really incumbent on us to take a closer look at um, the public prisons that we've created as well. Even if we eliminated private prisons tomorrow, it doesn't give us a pass on examining what we want out of our systems of punishment. I think that there are still very, very difficult decisions and discussions to be had on that front. So I'll, I'll stop there and hopefully we can have some discussion with the group. Um, so I was just telling uh, Michelle, I, I love the, you know, that phrase, we're subverting democracy, because um, when policymakers just um, contracted with these corporations and sort of did an end run around their voters and the constituents, that's part and parcel of not having these really tough conversations about who we incarcerate, why, and, and how much money it should be. And, and also, I love what you said about um, we should be spending money on incarceration. You, you always hear. I'm sure all of you have read articles. You know, one year in prison. You know, there's an argument about marginal versus average cost, but um, you know, one year in prison can cost as much as going to Harvard for a year 
In fact, it may cost more than going to Harvard or UT Law. And, you know, that's horrifying to a lot of people, certainly um, fiscal conservatives, um, a lot of conservatives, and, you know, the, the group Right on Crime um, has certainly um, been very vocal about the need to de-incarcerate and how much money we're wasting on incarceration. But we should be spending money on incarceration. I mean, if we as a society have decided that someone has violated the criminal code to such an extent that they need to be um, separated from their families, from their communities, we should be spending a lot of money on that. Um, and because we incarcerate 2.2 million people, we can't, we can't afford today's level of incarceration. And we've never been um, diligent, thoughtful at all about why, how we incarcerate. And there's so much research that didn't exist in you know, the 70s and the 80s about how to prevent crime. Right, and we all know it's not more and more prison. Right, people are not getting the programming in prison that they need to, um, you know, become contributing members of our society. Um, if you speak to any incarcerated individuals, they'll tell you, well, there are lines for all the programming you want, and you can only get into the programming if you're you know, three months before your release. And then there's always a problem getting into the programming. There's just not enough programming. We're not reducing recidivism. We're not getting at why someone may have committed a crime in the first place, which tends to be because someone has a drug problem or a mental health problem or some other underlying issue that we're not treating as a society. Um, so all of that is, is certainly the, the umbrella um, I think that covers a lot of this work about why we incarcerate, who we incarcerate, and sort of how we've interacted with the private prison industry as we've continually incarcerated more and more people over the years. Um, so I, I'd love to answer questions, and um, you know, I think we can both answer questions. Sure. Yeah, so I'm flipping through the book right now because chapter four is called The Prison Industrial Complex, um, which is about everything you just asked. So um, for those of you who um, are studying this issue or you know, more interest in getting, um, would like to get more involved or learn more about the history of privatization, um, I strongly recommend you read Eric Slosher's article in The Atlantic. It was published in 1998, I believe. And he coined the phrase, he actually denies he coined the phrase, but he was one of the first journalists to write about this prison industrial complex, which was a play on words, right, from Dwight Eisenhower and the military industrial complex. And it's this idea that um, we have a vast set of corporations that you just mentioned that make um, huge profits off of people enmeshed in the criminal justice system. So. You know, chapter four of this book details that, and you know, there are companies like JPay, and I used JPay when I was doing research for the book. Um, you pay 55 cents to email an incarcerated individual. You can include a stamp so that they can email you back. Um, but imagine, I mean, think about all the emails you get every day. Imagine paying 55 cents per email. You know, JPay gets a commission off of that. Um, you know, digging even deeper, most of the prisons or the states get a commission off of that contract as well. Telecommunications companies make vast profits. They have monopolies on, um, you know, a lot of the prison contracts. They may have a monopoly in an entire state. They get a portion of the, the phone calls. Um, a lot of states are moving to video visitation. There are, pr there are prisons in Texas um, that have moved t entirely to video visitation in lieu of in-person visits. Um, you know, talk about you know, not having the um, 
being able to see, hug, touch your family members. Um, and that's expensive. It's about $10 for 20 to 30 minutes of video visitation. Um, you know, incarcerated individuals are getting paid, you know, a quarter to a dollar an hour if they're working um, behind bars. I mean, this is an enormous burden on families, and these corporations are making a profit off of that. So you're absolutely right. I, and why that's incredibly significant is because when we have these conversations about de-incarceration, there are lobbyists who work for all of these corporations. There are, are um, you know, consultants who work for these corporations, and they make it harder to de-incarcerate. You know, we have built a system of punishment that goes hand in glove with these corporations that profit off of incarceration, and you know, reading the tea leaves that you know, I think. 27 states have reduced prison populations and crime in the last decade. You know, reading, reading those tea leaves, CoreCivic, Geo Group, some of these other corporations have started to diversify, and they own drug treatment centers, they own electronic monitoring centers. Um, and so we do have to be vigilant of the prison industrial complex um, and, and really understand how, how it works and who's making money um, and profiteering off of the 2.2 million people behind bars and the 5 million people on community corrections. So that's an excellent point. If I could respond as well, um, can you help here? Um, I think your point is really well taken, Andrea. Um, so now what a complicated. I don't, um, I don't know. Um, no, just to complicate it a little bit more, I often ask my students to think about this. Which is the piece about privatization that, or, or these issues that is troubling to them? Is it the fact that it's private? Is it the fact that it's for profit? And then we try to tease that out because we can talk about, there are examples of nonprofit private corrections, usually on the edges, like in some of the more treatment programs. Is that still troubling, and if so, why? But then we also talk about entrepreneurial corrections, which is when government is profiting off of this. And there's plenty of examples of that, too. Um, you've got counties that are making a lot of money by contracting with private companies to build larger facilities, and then they could rent out the beds to the federal government or to, uh, to Marshall Service or to ICE. Um, or to bring in inmates from other states. So you've got um, local governments that are making money. You've got state governments that if they have um, extra excess space in their facilities, they might rent out to other states as well. Does that bother us too? And then you don't have the company piece of it, but you do have the making money piece of it. So we, I think we need to tease out which parts of this um, are most problematic, um, and maybe it's all of it. So I'm glad you asked that question because I, I was surprised that these other countries are innovating in a way that we aren't. And in Australia, there's an indigenous population that, you know, th there are similar racial disparities in these other countries that we have here. You know, in the U.S., um, we incarcerate so many more blacks and Latinos than we do, you know, white Americans. Um, in Australia and New Zealand, you know, these racial disparities play out in terms of indigenous populations. Um, you know, poor, low-income individuals who are overly represented in these facilities. And they also have very high recidivism rates, and these are countries that are also experiencing increased prison populations right now. And they're just more innovative with, you know, it's a little bit different because they have these true <coughs> public-private partnerships um, where there's a consortium of companies and government agencies that own and operate these prisons. So it's a little bit more sophisticated than in the U.S. where we literally have a contract, you know, with the state of um, Kentucky with CoreCivic. Um, but they are innovating in a way that we're not. And, and we don't yet know what the results are. 
Um, so the next steps for this book are I'm actually, I'm hopefully traveling to Australia and New Zealand to actually do some research on what's happening there um, and interview some people who are involved and behind bars in those facilities um, because they may not be successful in reducing recidivism rates. You know, this is modeled off of social impact bonds. Um, you know, in the UK, there was the Peterborough Prison Project. Um, it was a government social impact bond. And the idea was to reduce recidivism among a certain cohort in a prison in the UK. And they were successful to a point. Um, there's this, another similar um, social impact bond in New York with Rikers Island, and actually was not successful. And the cohort of individuals did not reduce recidivism over the individuals who weren't you know, given this, these extra programming. Um, so some of these innovations may fail, but I think it's really important to study them and to innovate because some of them will succeed. And then we, we need to learn you know, whether it is possible to um, really incentivize reduced recidivism. Yeah, so both excellent questions. And um, in Dilly, Texas, uh, there's the South Texas um, Deten Family Detention Center, which is you know very close to Austin. Um, that contract is fascinating. So yes, yeah, so there's um, a city, Eloy, Arizona, that happens to have a lot of state and private prisons as is. And um, Dilly was built very quickly by CoreCivic um, under the Obama administration, and the contract actually runs through, through Eloy, Arizona. So in Eloy, they hold the contract. They have a commission just for having the contract run through their city. And so the contract with this family detention center is with Eloy, Arizona. CoreCivic owns it. ICE is involved. It's incredibly complicated. There was an NPR piece um, at the time when the um, facility was built and an attorney said they've never seen a contract written like this in their lives. Um, so it is very complicated, and especially with immigration detention where the contracts may be with, you know, a member of, an, you know, an MOU with the county and ICE is involved. Um, in terms of, of the book's recommendations, the transparency and accountability recommendations I think are certainly relevant to immigration detention centers. It is very, very, for any of you who do work in any of these immigration detention centers, it's very hard to keep track of individuals you're working with, of clients. It's very hard to gain access to um, these clients. And 
you, they're not transparent and accountable, and they're not, you know, they're not required to comply with open records requests at the federal level. And there has been a lot of litigation about this, and there was recently a Supreme Court case. Um, the Supreme Court uh, ref denied cert on a case, and I think it was, was it Detention Watch Network? It was a group of advocates who were litigating this case. Um, they were trying to get records from the government and from Geo Group, and Geo Group fought it all the way to the Supreme Court because they didn't want to turn over their records. I mean, is this this is you know terrible PR for the company? I don't know why they would litigate this all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, but by denying cert, the the Supreme Court actually ended up, um, you know, the lower court's ruling was to to turn over all of these documents, and that's what Geo Group and the government are now going to have to do. And the question on hand was actually about this um, bed mandate that you just mentioned. Um, so yes, yeah, some of the recommendations in the book are better suited to state and federal prisons that are privatized, and some of the recommendations are very relevant to um, the immigration detention centers as well. I don't know if you have anything else to add. Yeah, okay. And you're right, it's a huge money maker for them. And it's, it's very um, affordable because you don't have to provide any programming. In fact, the detainees in these facilities are getting paid $1 to $3 a day to sweep floors, work in the kitchen, fold laundry, um, and they don't have to provide any services or programming. So if I were the CEO of a private prison company, I mean, this is much more cost effective. This is a profit center, whereas you have to provide certain programming for state and federal prisons. So. There is a lawsuit over that. There is. So there's a lawsuit right now um, in Washington State. Um, the Attorney General in Washington State is suing Geo Group um, because you know the, it's a class action suit. Um, and the premise is that Geo Group, this private corporation, is profiting off of, of very cheap labor because they're paying one to three dollars a day for the detainees to do services, um, and they're saving on money. They're not hiring as many outside employees to do this work, and these are people who are not even U.S. citizens. Um, so a uh, court just um, approved the the class action, and the lawsuit's going forward, and so everyone should watch it. Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a very thoughtful question. I mean, there are a lot of performance measures um, that you can use on top of recidivism. I mean, recidivism is important, but even, you know, spending time in a prison does not necessarily translate into someone's recidivism rates. There, there's always, there are many reasons why someone may recidivate. So certainly looking at, um, you know, connect, uh, placement in jobs, after, you know, but that's also on the Department of Corrections, right? Sort of job training and then placement with corporations afterwards. Um, conditions of confinement, um, the programming that's offered, um, the level of assault, right? The level of sexual assault, the level of, um, you know, there's so many things that, that do go into these contracts. I mean, these corporations are fined. You know, I was in New Mexico in um, Gantt. It's an all-female all private prison. It was owned by CoreCivic. Um, and I spent the day with the monitor who used to work with, um, he used to be a, a CoreCivic employee, and then the New Mexico Department of Corrections hired him to monitor the same prison he used to be a warden at as a private prison employee. So. Um, for all of you studying sort of contract a lot, right, there's issues of capture there, right? I mean, he knew the names of, of everyone in the prison, you know, hi, Sam, hi, John. Um, and I thought, yeah, I mean, it was interesting spending the day with him. And I thought, you know, I don't, I wonder what he's, you know, 
is he really holding core civics feet to the fire is he really you know looking at com are they compliant with the number of correctional officers that sort of thing you know those are all performance measures and um, you know, he sent me a letter uh, the week after I visited the prison I was back in New York and he said I just wanted to let you know I find core civic $25,000 um, here's the letter I sent them and it had all the non-compliant activities so $25,000 is not a lot of money for, um, you know, core civic. Um, and it was for keeping people past their, parole, past their um, sentence release date. You know, that's something that the government does as well, but the government's not necessarily compensated for that individual. Um, it was for not having enough correctional officers. And, you know, these are all things that should be part of the performance measures and, and prisons should be held accountable for them. Um, and, and in the book, I use that example as a way to say $25,000. You know, we need to increase these fines because these corporations are, um, it's cheaper for them not to comply with a contract than it is to comply with a contract. So we need to greatly increase the fines. So we need to be thinking broader. We need to be thinking about job training. We need to be thinking about um, you know, so many other issues as well. Recidivism is just sort of traditionally, um, you know, in corrections, we haven't always had the most innovative, sort of thoughtful thinking about, you know, how we measure success, and so um, we need to do better. And just to add to, to that, um, I think that we need to be looking at safety measures about, um, you know, you mentioned you know, assault rates, sexual assault rates, et cetera, but they need to be reported to someone on a routine basis so we could be tracking that kind of information, and so it could be to public facilities data as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, this needs to be, in, yes, it needs to be subject to open record requests in, in FOIA, but it also needs to just be proactively put out there for you to follow up in, in these ways. Yes. Right, privatization, yeah. He, he himself was, you know, groomed by General Electric and others to be a bit, you know, uh, for the, you know, uh, private industry. And uh, I'm just wondering, like, uh, is that a larger, you know, pushback that needs to occur to kind of extol the virtues of the public sector, which in some parts of the world, you know, in Germany, you know, they are considered, uh, you know, fairly, you know, prestigious, uh, you know, public service as well. But in this country, you know, I mean, generally, you know, People seem to have been programmed in such a way, almost like a Pavlovian mismatch, that you know, government bad, private industry good. So I know that's a very large mm -hmm. debate, but uh, is there anybody who's speaking to that? I mean, the book looks at the history of privatization, and especially under President Reagan, you know, he loved his blue ribbon commissions, and he had mul you know many blue ribbon commissions. Um, to privatize parts of the government, and the Grace Commission was one of those big commissions, and um, its findings, some of its findings were we need to do more to privatize corrections because the government was doing such a bad job at running prisons and jails in this country. Um, so you're right, and, and that's part of, you know, why I thought this topic was so interesting was because we have a long history of privatizing and commodifying incarcerated people in this country, um, you know, from um, the beginning, from, you know, shipping um, incarcerated people from um, England to the U.S. on ships. I mean, that's, you know, how we built our country, how we built our railroads from, you know, slavery, Jim Crow laws, the commodification of incarcerated people today. You know, privatization is you know, runs parallel to a lot of the decisions that we've made to make money off of incarceration. You know, the book doesn't doesn't make a judgment on whether privatization in and of itself is right or wrong, but just really raises the issues around privatization and how we did privatize so much of our corrections and immigration detention and just ask questions about how we did so with such little accountability. Yeah. 
I mean, every state, we can, I think we can both answer this question in different ways. You know, I'm, I'm more familiar with how it works at the state and federal level, not, not as much with the local level, but every state's different. So Florida has its own independent agency where they monitor all state and private prisons. Um, in New Mexico, there is a monitor that's a Department of Corrections employee housed at every uh, private prison. Um, so that's the Department of Corrections responsibility. In um, Louisiana, the monitors are, are, are corrections employees and they drive around, but they call up the prisons and they say we're coming. Um, so every state monitors a little bit differently. There's no, you know, there's also the American Correctional Association and they audit prisons and they, and sh you know, they, um, rubber stamp these prisons as ACA compliant, but it's sort of a paper audit feel. Let me, let me qualify mm -hmm. what you're saying about the ACA. Um, the American Correctional Association is a voluntary accreditation agency, so only a state or a, a state uh, agency that wants to have its prisons accredited um, or its private prisons I accredited see. will request that mm -hmm. and they have to pay for it. So it's not required unless it happens to be some states put it in their contracts with private prisons that the private prisons have to be ACA accredited. It's not required at all. Um, we don't have to get into how good or bad those um, those audits are, but the fact that it's voluntary and paid for is probably all that you need to know about that. But it's not really a trick question. Um, plenty of ACA accredited facilities have been sued around the country, public and private. Um, so, and, and then just to follow up on It'll be whoever is responsible for funding these um, uh, these facilities. So usually it'll be like if it's a county facility, it'll be a county, county correctional facility. So that's how it works. And there are only a couple. Uh, you know, Florida has this independent agency. Illinois has an independent agency. New York City has an independent agency. But most of these agencies don't have a lot of enforcement power or subpoena power. You know, we really have very weak enforcement of state prisons in this country and jails. Um, you know, we don't, there have been groups that have, you know, clamored for national um, oversight, you know, with teeth, with enforcement power, with subpoena power. Um, I think we're a long way from that. Yeah, and, and that's a wonderful question because, you know, the book does, you know, at the end say, look, most of the words here have been about the privatization of justice, um, but we have a problem with prisons in this country. Um, I mean, we have, you know, we have the Prison Rape Elimination Act. I mean, it took a decade to draft it. It's finally implemented, and so many states are not compliant with the PREA laws. Um, that's a public prison issue and a private prison issue. Y you know, so many of the problems with private prisons are the same problems that public prisons have. You know, but the idea of focusing on these private prisons is we have a lever, right? And yes, some of these contracts are, are hard to get out of, but the government has the power here. The private prison industry shouldn't have the power. You know. If we have decided that we're going to rely on a private prison to um, house incarcerated individuals in our state or at the federal level, we have tools with the contract, with ending the contract, with fine, with increasing the fines, um, with you know performance-based contracts, perhaps pay bonuses. I mean, we have so many tools that we're not using that we've never used because no one has said let's actually make these corporations work much harder for their profits. Um, so, so that's sort of, I, I think, one of the big takeaways of the book. 
but you're right. Our, you know, I mean, we have oversight issues. We, you know, jails and prisons are, you know, places where you know conditions of confinement for the most part are pretty horrible, um, and people are not getting the programming they need. And um, you know, we have a public prison problem in this country, um, and so we we need to improve conditions of confinement in all of our prisons. We need to improve accountability and transparency in our public prisons too. Um, but by rewriting these contracts, you know, that's one significant step we can take to ensure that, you know, some of the people behind bars, you know, their conditions are better, their outcomes are hopefully better. Yes, and you know, in, in the U, I mean, the U.S. is a, a very large country. Um, but if you look to Germany, the Netherlands, you know, Western European countries, incarcerated people have keys to their cells in some of these prisons, and they are riding their bikes to work, and they're working, and then they're coming home, and some of them have knives in their kitchen, in their prison cells, because they're cooking. And you know, the way that we, you know, if you go to a prison in Georgia. You know, a lot of the corrections officers have masks and tear gas, and you know it's such a different environment than prisons in some other parts of the world. So you know, our system is punitive on the front ends, um, and then it's also punitive once you're incarcerated as well. It does. I mean, we have a history of, I mean, you just said institutionalized racism in this country. And, you know, those racial disparities are evident if you walk around any jails and prisons. I think a really interesting example is how some states are starting to deal with the opioid ep epidemic. And, you know, I, I'm in New York City where, you know, crack cocaine um, was very scary to a lot of people. And, you know, white Americans living in the suburbs who were using powder cocaine were treated very differently by the criminal justice system. I think the ratio was 100 to 1. Um, then, you know, inner city Latinos and blacks who were using crack cocaine, which is, you know, the chemistry is exactly the same drug. If you look at the opioid epidemic, um, you know, that is really hitting um, urban America, rural America, middle America very hard. And a lot of those users are white. And, you know, we've seen in Vermont, and, and this is a good thing, right, but the governor of Vermont is dealing with the opioid epidemic in Vermont as a public health crisis, not as a criminal justice issue. And a lot of the people in Vermont who are suffering from opioid <coughs> abuse are white. And that's just one example of how the country is capable of treating those who are breaking the law differently based on the color of their skin. Um, you know, there are a lot more women who are incarcerated today than many years ago. There are more white women who are incarcerated today, partly because of drugs. And so because of that, we have started to see more and more, um, you know, white conservative policymakers advocate, advocating for different policies. So you're absolutely right. Um, and, you know, the U.S. has a very... Um, troubled 
you know, still wrestling with its past. Uh, you know, we had institutionalized slavery in this country, and you know, some of these other countries didn't have that, right? And so, so it's a very different history, and our growth of incarceration is very intimately linked to that. So that is part of part of the the difference um, with how we've treated people who violate the criminal law and how they're incarcerated.